Will you pray with me? Merciful God, say a word to your people. Break through that we might hear a life-giving word from you and be transformed in the hearing. Amen. Biblical scholars maintain that the story of Noah and the ark originated with the Jewish priests offered during Israel's exile to assure the people of God who had witnessed what looked like the unraveling of creation that God had not forgotten them. But it is also an assertion that notwithstanding their situation of exile, God did not view them as an enemy to be violently vanquished. And given the unraveling of their entire world through exile, the people of Israel must have wondered if God had given up on God's commitment to what God created. And so this story about the unraveling of all creation in a destructive flood while sparing Noah and his family and the animals he sheltered with him in the ark, culminates with God laying bare divine regret, intention, and new commitments. God's radical affirmative response to destruction comes in the form of the first covenant in the biblical witness that God makes with humanity. And in simple words attributed to God, God declares that God is establishing a covenant with all of creation, symbolized with the sign of a bow, which will prompt God to remember what God had promised. A simple formulation Establishing a covenant with all of creation, symbolizing it so that God will be prompted to remember the promise. And oh, just in case the import of what God is doing is not missed, God declares that the covenant is everlasting. God does not ask for anything from Noah and his family or any of the living creatures. God, God just offers unrestricted binding, unrestricted obligation of God in relationship with humanity, with all of the animals and with the entire created order. Oh, I, 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 I hope, I hope we don't move too fast away from what God has done here. Creation remains willful and imperfect. Evil has not been overcome or transformed, and the sin of the world will likely grieve God mightily in the future. And yet, after having struck out in anger against the creation before, this time, God repents. You see, I stepped right into Lent there. God repents. God changes God's mind. God returns to God's truest and original intent to a creation that God loved and declared good. And just so God will never be tempted to strike out in anger again, God erects an undrawn bow as a sign to help God remember. Oh, see, not only does God repent, God disarms. Oh, we're talking Lent. God, dis God gives up power. God gives up the right to act. God places a limit on God's freedom to act in God's own interest for the sake of the survival of creation. God's covenant 
changes the meaning of a symbol, the weapon of a bow, from one of retribution to one of peace, from one of death to one of life. This is the stuff of Lent. Oh, let's, I, I know I'm moving fast, but I hope you stay with me just a little bit here. I hope we see how utterly gracious and determined God is to be in relationship. I suspect, I do, and, and it's sad, I suspect that if God was seeking our counsel, many of us would advise God not to do it. They don't deserve it. God, they will let you down. But no matter how flawed the creation may be, no matter how willful and disobedient humanity may be, no matter how diabolical and idolatrous we will become and we will become so, God promises never again, never again, will I unravel the creation. God eternally entangles God's self with creation. And I know at a time when the language of covenant feels stilted and when the purpose of Lent feels increasingly unfamiliar, God models intentionality, commitment, and accountability to keep our hope alive, possibly to keep God's hope alive. This is the essence of covenant. This is the essence of Lent. This is about making an intentional effort at being in relationship and then deciding to be obligated and accountable to, to give up on being untethered, unmoved, and unconcerned about the fate of the other. God makes a promise not to be provoked or goaded into giving up on creation or striking out in anger and retribution. God relinquishes, relinquishes. God relinquishes the divine prerogative to storm off and break faith and relationship in righteous indignation with a sinful an idolatrous creation. It is a promise, a promise to stay, to stay present, to stay engaged, to stay entangled, to stay in relationship. Oh, I know, I know some, some will rightly argue that given what we have seen in this world, God has a mixed record on staying the hand of destruction against creation. Evil holds sway all over creation. Death and destruction from floods, earthquakes, hurricanes, war, genocide have destroyed God's good creation. One can argue that there is an unraveling of God's good creation going on even now. But if we take seriously God's promise of an unrestrictive covenant with all generations, all living creatures, with all of the earth, then we need not fear that these floods are God's doing. We need not fear that God is drawing that divine bow against us as God's enemies. On the contrary, we too should be reminded that, in, that despite what comes against us, God's intentionality, God's commitment, God's accountability to us in covenant means that we get to start again, that our story isn't destruction, but because of God's graciousness, our story is always newness, possibility, starting again. Oh, we're talking about Lent. We're talking about Lent. The word covenant, the word covenant, I, I, I know it's, 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 anachronistic to our modern ears, and an ancient language that does not reflect our technical understanding of contracts or our cultural conceptions of relationship. I, I wonder, though, if the resistances we feel comes from the idea that obligation and accountability to another assaults our sense of individualism. Oh, we are self-made people. Oh, we are self-sufficient. We can, we can do it. 
And so to obligate ourselves to others in some way doesn't feel quite civilized. And we've also been, been conditioned by religion and politics and capitalism to move through the world focused on our choices and our own self-interests. We, we get to move through the world untethered, unmoved, unconcerned about the faith of those who are not of our tribe. Perhaps committing ourselves to relationship with imperfect people or people not of our own ilk is too hard and potentially limits our right to, to judge and separate from them. And I do know, I do know how easily we are goaded into believing that God and humanity are enemies, not my enemy, but enemies to them. We're easily goaded into believing that, 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 Somehow God is at odds with us. And in our fear, we have to find the others who are less than we are, more sinful than we are, more deserving of judgment than we are, and less deserving of the break we deserve. Oh, but in the person of Jesus, we continue to see just how unrestrictive and everlasting God's covenant is. Jesus expands the promise of life to a new generation, entangling God deeper with creation, especially for those who have been discarded and disregarded and dispossessed. Oh, this is the stuff of covenant and Lent. And I do know that right now it does look like, it does look as if our, our creation is unraveling. A global pandemic causing millions of deaths all over the world. Unstable climate patterns due to climate change, creating unimaginable weather in unexpected regions of our nation and the world. Our electorate is so polarized that voting and elections are less preferred by some citizens than insurrection and lifetime rule by autocrats. Disinformation and conspiracy theories are so embedded in our information platforms that communication is nearly impossible across cultural and ideological differences. Racial hatred and white supremacy are so seemingly intractable that simply declaring Black Lives Matter remains a debatable fact for many. It seems as if our creation is unraveling before our eyes, but we need not fear God. The bow is undrawn. The covenant is everlasting. What the world has become does not appear to be an attempt by God to unravel us. And if we are honest, and this is the season that calls for honesty and truth telling. Perhaps we are the ones we should be afraid of. It is the human being that is waging war on each other, on living creatures on the earth. It is the human being that has forgotten what it means to commit and obligate oneself to God, neighbor, and creation in newness and graciousness. It is the human being who is oppressing, dominating, exploiting the most vulnerable among us. We need not fear God. God remembers it is, it, 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 it is the, it's the government that is tasked with the welfare of their people that has broken covenant with, with the poor, broken covenant with black people, broken covenant with our indigenous inhabitants. We see it clearly. Our government will not share power or resources with vulnerable people, will not intentionally obligate itself to, to make vulnerable people whole and then turns around and accuse them of failing in their obligations to the body politic. 
It's the government that over polices people. It incarcerates them in mass for the slightest infraction. It is, it is government that withholds living wages, affordable housing and health care and good education, then turns around and blames them for not upholding their end of the bargain of citizenship. Oh, we need not fear God. Perhaps we have some role to play in the unraveling of creation. And the answer is come home. Remember the covenant. Remember the obligation God made to us. As part of this call to reconsider the language and practice of covenant making, one scholar said simply, human beings should follow the divine lead. What would it mean to do as God did and give up the right to be righteously indignant at everybody else, to, to repent and disarm and reach out in covenant to others. How, how do we covenant with each other such that our community becomes a refuge of safety and wholeness and restoration for anyone who comes through the door? How do we act with intentionality, commitment, and accountability so that we become guarantors of survival even as the world around us unravels? The peace, the justice, the, the beloved community we hope for begins with being intentionally committed to each other and to those who need us, to the vulnerable, and never forgetting, never forgetting one another. It is a call for entangling ourselves in relationship with others like God entangles God's self with us. It is precisely God's nature and intention in, in obligating God's self to creation that is so unrestricted that, that should impress upon us just how radical it is to be renewed and, and rescued and, and returned to a God determined to be gracious to us no matter what. So, during this season of Lent, my invitation is that we reclaim the language and practice of covenant. That we repent and change our minds as best and as often as we can. And then, and then we, we place signs around us. Signs and symbols and commitments that will help us to remember, remember the promise of covenant. God repented, God disarmed, and God pledged God's self eternally to the creation. We need not fear God. We just open ourselves to the promise of God's covenant. Amen.